Good afternoon. This is Craig Lois. Sitting to my left, your right, Declan Gorley. Uh, sitting to my further left, your further right, Tashia Razul. Uh, thanks for joining us today. If you're here today, it's to talk, uh, do a little Q&A on the Fund for Reopen Cases, uh, reopening uh, potentially to some claims that we'll be able to get reimbursement for from the fund. Uh, this is a pretty hot topic. Uh, uh, the presenters I'm here with today uh, prepared the handout that you've received. If you did not receive the handout in your email, sometimes it'll get caught up in a spam filter. Uh, you can download it directly uh, from the GoToWebinar panel on your screen. It's also been uploaded to this uh, meeting. Uh, so far, we have uh, just over 85 attendees so far, so I'm hoping for a lot of good questions today. If you can see us but you can't hear us, uh, there might be a problem with your computer audio. Uh, there's also a phone number on the GoToWebinar screen you can dial in, especially if we're dropping in or dropping out. Uh, this is not part of our overall webinar series, but we do do a lot of training. Uh, these are always done live. Uh, in New York, we do a webinar series always the third Monday of the month. In New Jersey, it's always the fourth Monday of the month. The webinar series basically follows our uh, materials, the handbooks that we have for both states. And in fact, today we're going to be talking about uh, the reopener of these old claims. And it's actually in our chapter 17 of our 2016 book. So if you don't have a copy of our book, our handbook to New York Workers' Comp, let us know. It's just a small part of what we do uh, to reach out to our clients uh, and do outreach uh, to the workers' compensation community in, in whole. Uh, please, we have handbooks. We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of articles on our website going back nine years. Uh, of course, we do these webinars, and we also do a monthly newsletter. And this webinar actually resulted from us sending out some information in our newsletter. We got so many inquiries back in, we said, let's just do a big round table for the whole community. Um, all right, so I think that's about it for table setting. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, reopeners just sort of in general in New York, and we're going to talk about the impact of the new case. Declan will cover that. Um, this is absolutely live. We're sitting here in our office. We've got our materials in front of us. Your questions will pop up on the screen. Um, we're going to do sort of a brief overview of the topic. We're going to do a brief overview of the new decision that just came out last week, which is why I think everyone's on the line today. And then uh, we'll answer your questions uh, until we run out of questions or we get stumped, I guess, one or the other. <laughs> okay, uh, so with that, I'm going to ask Tashia to take it over. Okay. Hi, everyone. So to begin with, let's talk about some of the lingo we're going to use here today so that we're not confused about what exactly we're talking about. We're going to be referring to the um, special fund using a couple of different terminologies. Special fund for reopen cases is actually the official name. We'll also refer to it as the 25A fund, uh, commonly also known as the special funds, and also reopen case spe uh, special funds. Right. So any of these words, I mean, I think we all know what we're here for, but it's, we're going to use these terms sort of interchangeably. Uh, so there's all sort of unofficial terms for the same thing. Right. There. So just to give you a little background on Section 25A. It was created to administer and pay indemnity and medical benefits and stale claims. These are old claims that were being reopened by the claimant for uh, medical treatment or additional lost time awards. The purpose of the fund was to relieve employers and carriers of the liability of these stale claims. And it was created with the intent of protecting both the claimant and the carriers. It was... Um, created with the idea of circumventing the possibility of carriers running out of money to pay these claims many, many years down the road, and also to ensure that the claimants receive continuous treatment in the event that they need it and in a timely manner. The special fund, it's funded by assessments against employers and their carriers, as well as self-insured employers. Employers with an insurance policy, they're assessed based on their premiums, and self-insured employers were assessed based on their indemnity payments. <clears throat> now, what exactly does the fund pay? The fund pays out claims that meet two criteria to begin with, and these are statutory. The first is if the claim has to be more than seven years old, meaning seven years must have elapsed from the date of the injury. And the second criteria is more than three years must have elapsed from the date of the last compensation. 
Now, payments of compensation, we must remember, it refers to indemnity benefits and not medical benefits. Therefore, if the claimant was receiving ongoing medical benefits, this would not bar an application for special funds relief. Now, in addition to the statutory requirements, one of the challenging issues that carriers faced over the years in trying to seek uh, special funds relief is establishing true closing of the claim. Which seems like it should be simple, but right. it absolutely is not. I mean, every time we go to court, or most times we go to court, the judges mark the cases, no further action or closed, and we think that that language means that the claim is closed. However, it's not, and it's been a really, really big challenge. Now, the court uh, has established a standard. The board has established a standard that they use, and the standard is whether... Um, further proceedings are contemplated at the time that the case was quote unquote closed, when we believe that it was actually closed. And to give you some examples of what it means, um, if a claimant's doctor submits a medical report indicating that the claimant has some degree of permanent disability, but for some reason the board does not address that issue, it means that further proceedings were contemplating contemplated. Right. And, and I mean, I think that's one of the most frustrating ones where we think with the case is closed, there's an opinion out there that might have led to an SLU. And then special funds defense will say, well, you could have done an SLU back then. You didn't do it. Case right. wasn't closed. Mm -hmm. Other examples include things like if the board directed the carrier to produce a C-240 weight statement and nothing happens after that, special funds would argue that the C-240 wait statement was never addressed, average weekly wage was never addressed, and therefore further proceedings were contemplated at the time when that was directed. Um, another example would be when additional injuries are actually raised by the claimant, but let's say PFME was not produced or PFME was produced but nothing else was done after that. Special funds would argue, and a lot of times, most times successfully, that the claim was never truly closed because the additional body part was never addressed. So these are just some examples um, of, of situations where we may think that the claim was closed because nothing's happened for seven years or three years, but under the legal standard, they're not truly closed and it would not be eligible for uh, special funds relief. <clears throat> Now, what happened was that the, the special funds was closed. It was closed effective January 1st of 2014, which meant that the, the, the fund and the board were not accepting applications for special fund relief effective of this date. The problem that happened with the closing of the fund was that the insurance carriers and the self-insureds who actually paid the premiums, those assessments that I talked about earlier, in anticipation of the, the funds going to be around forever, they were being prejudiced because they were not able to benefit from the fund. I think the word is ripped off. Well, because <laughs> it's approximately eighteen percent of the pre on, on top was going towards special yes. funds. So ripped off is a definitely word. ripped off. And what happened was the issue was litigated. And last week, we um, there's now a landmark case that came down where the court addressed this issue and found that the retroactive application. Uh, to policies uh, issued before October 1st of 2013 is unconstitutional. Now, um, this was, just to backtrack a little bit, the, the special fund was closed as a result of the Business Relief Act. Uh, they were um, trying to save the, the carriers from additional expenses because they were, the premiums were raising significantly because more and more claims were being shifted the special funds. Right. And let's just be careful. It wasn't exactly closed, but it wasn't accepting new applications. Correct. Right. So the applications that were filed before January 1st of 2014, the board were still litigating those issues. And I'm pretty sure two years later, they're probably still litigating those issues <laughs> yeah. because it's a time consuming and very, um, well, that's the pace the board process. moves at. Yeah. That too. Yes. All right. So let's talk about the impact of the new case and what the new case says. Declan? Okay, so the reason why we're all here today is because of last week's uh, appellate division case, um, American Economy versus the State of New York, and essentially a group of private workers' comp insurance carriers 
uh, filed a lawsuit after the 2013 amendment uh, to 25A, closing the fund effective January 1st, 2014. Uh, essentially, what the lawsuit alleges is that um, the carriers had paid premiums based prior to, on, uh, prior to October 1st, 2013, with the idea that in the future we'll be able to shift liability if we meet the criteria for 25A to the special fund. Therefore, they bargained for con they they enter the contract with the idea that they will be able to shift liability in the future. Essentially, the amendments to 25A then foreclose that, and <coughs> all of a sudden, the liability that they didn't think they would have in the future, this now they're exposed to. So this group of uh, private insurance carriers filed a lawsuit, and last week the court came back and um, rescinded or found that the amendment was unconstitutional um, based on both the takings clause of the United States Constitution and the contract clause of the United States Constitution. Uh, the takings clause, they found it in violation because basically um, the in ca insurance carriers were not able to anticipate that after, whenever they uh, entered their policy in October 1st, 2013, that sometime in the future, they would be on the hook for all these claims that when they signed the contract or they opened up their policy that they thought they would be able to get off the hook for those future claims. Um, basically, the amendment went back and restructured the contract, and that's in essence why they violate the uh, contract, uh, contracts clause of the United States Constitution. So there was two, um, two violations of the United States Constitution according to the appellate division. Uh, of course, it's possible that um, the state will appeal this further to the Court of Appeals, even potentially make this a Supreme Court case. But in, for the time being, um, the impact of this case is that if you had a policy prior to or in effect, as of October 1st, 2013, you can now file your application for 25A relief even after January 1st, 2014. So essentially, the fund is not closed if your for your policy that was in effect in October 1st, of two, as of October 1st, or prior to October 1st, 2013, I should say. Right. So essentially, um, in reviewing the case, the data loss is irrelevant. So if someone got injured uh, six months later, as long as the policy was in effect as of October 1st, 2013, when those premiums were paid, the assessments were based on, you would still be able to seek relief uh, once you meet the two standard criteria that she already discussed for 25A liability. Great. So that's a little overview of how we got to where we are today. Uh, we received a bunch of emails in advance already with questions that we can answer. Uh, but at this point, I'm gonna close down the main screen here for a second, and we're gonna go to the questions. Uh, and before I uh, do that, this is your opportunity to type any questions in. We can see them pop up on our screen here. Uh, and here we go. So the first question that we have from a uh, viewer is, okay. This is from Leonard who says, Greg, what about the issue of 25A affidavits? We have cases where the 25A efforts were derailed due to a lack of claimant cooperation. If we start to pursue 25A again, will we have to deal with the affidavit issue again? Leonard, I think the answer to that one is pretty clear. Uh, none of the procedural rules changed for how we apply for 25A relief at all. Uh, in fact, we've already contacted special funds office this morning to say, hey, what's the process? Has anything changed? Is there any new form? Is there anything different from the way we were uh, previously pursuing this relief? And the answer from them was, no, absolutely not. You know, file your RFA too, and, and we'll deal with it in due course. So, you know, the, the response to that is, no, we think that the procedure is going to be exactly the same, which is, as we discussed before, the claimant's going to file that C-25, uh, or there's going to be an RFA too that's going to be asking for right. that relief. And just to add to that, in filing the RFA too, in order to get it, get the board's attention, because we know how sometimes the board can just ignore the RFA twos, we would recommend making it as detailed as possible with all of the pertinent information, which includes um, an assertion that the claim is more than seven years old, that the last payment of compensation was uh, more than three years ago. If the carrier also has information about the, the, the employee's work status, if he's still working for the same employer, they can also include in the RFA too that he's been working full time, full wages, and not light duty because that's one of the issues that's usually addressed. Um, also, uh, document um, whether you believe, based on the information in the file, that at the time of closing there was actually no determined um, anticipation or uh, what there was no like prediction that the there were any outstanding issues that were 
that would need to be resolved. In other words, that it was actually truly closed. I believe the more detailed the RFA2 is and the affirmation that goes with it, it'll capture the board's attention to at least bring the case on for a hearing. And it'll also force the claimant to file something if they're trying to contest any of the information in it. Yeah, I strongly agree. And I think the second part of Leonard's question is just really, what do we do when the claim is not cooperating? <laughs> I mean, we're still left with the same uh, limited set of tools to get a non-cooperative claimant you know, to fill out affidavits and to help right. us, you know, uh, uh, put all the proofs in that we need to get that contribution from 25A. All and right. Practically speaking, the board hasn't reacted yet. I mean, this case just came out last week, so I'm assuming they're scrambling at this point to, to do something, make some type of process up. Uh, as of now, the process is filing RFA, but um, I would anticipate that sometime in the near future, the next 30 days, we'll probably get a board bulletin telling us what the board is anticipating doing because, I'm sure that they're not going to be in a rush to litigate these cases, especially if they anticipate they're going to file this appeal. The state's going to file the appeal further. Yeah, I mean, think about this. Right. They already laid off all these 25A attorneys that were doing this. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, they, you know, they were out there looking for jobs like two years ago, and now most have landed at defense firms. Uh, you sort of anticipating the next question came in from William, and uh, this actually speaks to something we were talking about, sort of the buzz we're hearing in the courts. Uh, uh, this is William L., who says, Greg, should there be a race to apply at this time, or can we expect that these are going to be held in abeyance <laughs> until an appeal comes in? So I think we've heard some buzz in the court uh, about that. Uh, definitely, you might want to speak to that. <laughs> I don't know how accurate this is, but yesterday when I was in court, I heard a couple of attorneys saying that they, they, they had spoken to a judge or overheard a judge saying that they had gotten uh, correspondence from the board basically saying that if, if this issue 25A is raised on the record to kind of distract the uh, carrier's attorney from raising the issue. I don't know if they want us to, the, the judges to shake a shiny <laughs> object and kind of distract us, but yeah, I mean, that, that's, again, that's, that's gossip. Okay. This is conjecture. We don't know. Um, William's question is to whether, Hey, should we be racing to apply at this time? I don't think there's any harm in getting these applications in or not applications, right. but filing these RFA twos and sort of getting that process going. Um, yeah, hey, you never know what they're going to do or how they're going to legislatively correct this or, or change it again. Uh, the window is open now. I think we can race, but I don't think there's any rush that the board's going to be racing to address right. these issues. <laughs> okay, uh, the next question comes in from Marita T. Uh, Greg, if the state appeals, what's the time frame for that appeal? Uh, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit here, but uh, will the appellate division or can, and if the appellate division upholds the current decision, is there a further appeal to this that the state has available? Uh, no, this is an appellate decision. So the uh, the next level of appeal here would be to the Court of Appeals. That's New York's highest court. And as you just sort of aptly described, uh, we do anticipate that there's going to be additional litigation. Um, okay, so here's Dan uh, asking a question. Greg, what's the likelihood the state will file a rebuttal to the decision of the appellate division? I think we're talking about that we do anticipate this will be further appealed. Um, and if they do so, can they prevent the filing of RFA 2s until the appeal is determined? Uh, basically, Dan, what you're suggesting, or the question here is really, can they stay the reversal of that or the finding of unconstitutionality? Uh, that's a that's a great question as to whether they can stay it. There has been at this time uh, no application to sort of stay that or injunctive relief that they will not accept applications. Again, we did call special funds this morning. Uh, they are saying. Yep, you can do it. Go file your RFA, too. In fact, the decision actually says that they anticipate the, the state will do the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Jennifer H. is asking, Greg, where can I get a copy of the 25A affidavit? Um, I had it saved in a folder, but I deleted it. <laughs> uh, the form is not available on eCase anymore. Okay, so I think what we're saying here is I had one, then the, the window closed, and now I, got, I lost it or I may have, uh, need to recreate it. Okay, so that's a challenge. Uh, yeah, back up your stuff, I guess. If it's not on e-case, um, maybe you could do a, uh, a replacement affidavit. Um, uh, Tim asks a great question. This is Tim R. Uh, I think we've talked about this a few times now. Greg, do you feel that this decision will be further appealed by the state? And how long do you feel until claims for this relief will be heard? I think this is the biggest question. Yeah. Again, right now, uh, the information is that uh, we can be filing them filing away our request for reimbursement. So our advice is to get your RFA in, but we're not 
quite sure at this stage until the board addresses it how quickly they're going to actually listen to these cases. Yeah, I'm going to um, skip any other questions like that that are asking us about the appeal because, again, it hasn't been filed. And currently the process is to make the application. So don't be offended if you've got questions out there and there's a lot I want to get to. So Gloria Jean asked this question. So if the policy has the that has the accident on it was effective on October 2nd, 2014, you have no recourse, question mark. That's correct. Yeah, if the right. policies after, if your policy went into effect as of October 1st or later, you basically paid your assessments or your premium based on the idea that special funds would be closed. Therefore, the idea is that you were not harmed. There was no uh, liability that was out there that you couldn't foresee. Any contra any policy that was written prior to October 1st, 2013, the idea was you were harmed because there was no way you could potentially see that in the future. The state was going to come in and say, "Aha, we're changing the law, and therefore." Now your liability is uh, exponentially increased from what you thought you weren't going to have in the future. Okay, and Mark G. asked the question. It's almost a follow-up question uh, to Gloria Jeans. Uh, uh, Declan, will policy information need to be supplied with the RFA2 to prove the policy was enforced prior to October 1, 2013? Well, this goes. Yes, right. I would, I would yeah. submit it if we yes. have it. Let's submit it now, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it wouldn't harm us. If we don't yeah. have it, I would not file the RFA. But if we do have it, I this goes along with what she was saying. We give them as much information as possible to avoid a delay. So if you have information that says the policy was in effect prior to October first, two thousand thirteen, I would go as far as sending them a copy of the, the policy. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, we also received some um, questions via email uh, this week. Um, do you guys want to take one each, maybe, of those questions that we got we, we received earlier? As soon as we announced this, people were uh, blizzarding us. We got a couple good ones uh, that I thought were maybe good ones to answer for everybody. Okay, sure. Uh, so one of the questions that we were being asked, I think, all week was, what about self-insurers and what about group trusts? So based on the reading of the, the case law and the statute, we do believe that uh, those, um, the group trust and the self-insured employers are entitled to the same relief as the private insurance carrier. The reason is they were also being assessed a premium for the special funds prior to um, the closing of the special funds. So it would in fact be prejudicial if they weren't entitled to the same relief because they're now at a loss of that money as well. So we do believe it. the answer is yes, that it does apply to the group trust and the self-insured employers. Okay, and another question just came in. Uh, and this is Leticia S. who says, uh, Declan, we have a lot of very old claims. We've been waiting to reopen. The claimants have resumed treatment. The data loss is way before October 1, 2013. Uh, they're, I guess what she's telling us is now that they are ripe, uh, are we able to request 25A relief now? I would say if they were ripe prior to January 1st, 2014, and they're still ripe, then the fact that you didn't file it before January 1st, 2014, you shouldn't be prejudiced, as this basically, this amendment was, and the closing of, the, of uh, 25A as of January 1st, has basically been ruled ineffective. Uh, so I would go ahead and file those claims. Right. I agree. Okay. Uh, to Shia, uh, this question comes from Matt B. Matt B. asks, uh, do you foresee 25A being awarded and a notice of decision being filed granting 25A during the possible appeal process by the state? Well, again, I guess it depends on if the board even uh, addresses the issue or what they're going to do in terms of, like, addressing the issue. Well, file the RFA, too. They might just put, them, put, put them aside saying they're not going to address them. But... If they decide that they are actually going to address the RFA 2 as they're being filed, there will be hearings and we will, like, there will be uh, full uh, trials on the issue and they will um, render uh, decisions regarding their finding on the Section 25A liability. So I think it depends on what exactly the board is going to do uh, in the foreseeable future, whether they're going to acknowledge the RFAs and take action or just decide to not handle them at this time. And if they were to render a decision and then the state appealed this further, then I think that would be a basis for special funds to file an appeal, obviously, and say, hey, you can't make a decision on this until our underlying, if the, if the fund is closed as January 1st, 2014, then this new case that you're deciding now is irrelevant. Right. So I think it's going to cause a major backlog in the system without a doubt, but that wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be my advice to hold off or not do anything. It would be to get it in as soon as possible. 
Okay. And we've got a few questions here. I'm going to kind of group them all together. Dan asked this question. John asked this question. Tim asked this question. All asking, hey, what's the difference between the elimination of 25A, uh, I'm sorry, the, the foreclosure of 25A applications and the straight up elimination of the second injury fund? And we're talking about 15A there. And the, the questions are sort of saying, hey, they did one and it got by, uh, was past constitutional muster and the other one didn't. I think the distinction is that the premiums were being collected by the state. Uh, right. they, you know, the, the uh, um, carriers are not writing coverage because they're making the presumption uh, that, hey, this, when, th when this case comes back, it's not my exposure. So I sort of th feel like those are the distinctions. And that's basically a, a fundamental fairness, uh, constitutional taking dis uh, basis of the decision by the appellate division. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, and then uh, just to paraphrase a few questions, Tim asked this question, Randy asked this question, a few others asked a question along these lines. Greg, uh, if we already settled claims uh, and were eligible for reimbursement, but settled it anyway because we thought 25A was really closed and foreclosed, hmm. or uh, another variation of that question that we've got is, uh, what if we've already started paying, presuming that, that the reopener fund wasn't going to be there, uh, what do we do then? Okay, so I think in that, the, the answer uh, where you've already started repaying is I would immediately be filing my RFA to try to reimburse and recoup that money uh, from the state fund as soon as I could. But as far as case with settlement, I think that unfortunately under Section 32, once you've settled the case, unless all parties are agreeing to come back and, and – uh, on basically unsettle the yeah, undo the yeah, settlement. You're out of luck. That's think, not going to happen. Yeah. yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. All right, so those are the questions we've got. Uh, it's 12:30. That's about the time we had allotted. Uh, at this point, uh, we're going to take a break from answering questions. Uh, and just remind everyone that you can always email us your questions. You can call us your questions if we didn't get to them. I think we got to a lot of them and also tried to group together sort of similar questions in our responses. Um, if you found this useful, if you found the webinar helpful, please join our webinar series. Uh, it's every month. We, top, we, we basically uh, do 101. We walk right through the handbooks in both states, and it's really useful for training, uh, particularly, I think, for adjusters and risk professionals. It's really who it's geared towards. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, again, if you have any other questions, Tashia Razul, Declan Gourley are ready to answer them. Okay, have a great day, everybody.